Good evening, and thanks so much for joining us at the Free Library of Philadelphia at Home. My name is Laura Kovacs, executive producer of Author Events. Before we begin tonight's presentation, I'd like to point out a few useful features on your screen. You'll see there's a button below that links to the Joseph Fox Bookshop, where you can buy a copy of tonight's book, The Stressed Years of Their Lives, Helping Your Kids Survive and Thrive During Their College Years. You'll also see the ask a question link, which you can use to ask a question, suggest a topic, or upload a question by using the arrows in the left margin. It is now my honor to introduce our moderator this evening. Elizabeth Mosier is the author of most recently, Excavating Memory, Archaeology and Home. Her 30 year career in higher education includes teaching creative writing, directing a Pooh College program, and directing admissions communications at Bryn Mawr College. And now the screen is all yours. I am delighted to introduce our speakers and their profoundly helpful work. Psychologist and family therapist B. Janet Hibbs is a nationally recognized authority on family issues with a focus on parent-child and partner relationships. A longtime faculty member at Drexel University, she is also the author of Try to See It My Way, Being Fair in Love and Marriage. Though Dr. Hibbs holds the highest credential in the marriage and family therapy field as an approved supervisor for the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapists, she considers her most meaningful credential to be that of mom. Child and adolescent psychiatrist and pediatrician Anthony Rostain was named the 2020 Champion for Recovery by Laurel House, Inc. Dr. Rostain's clinical focus, Lifespan Neural Developmental Psychiatry, includes Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, Autism Spectrum Disorders, Tourette Syndrome, Learning Disabilities, and Related Social-Emotional Learning Disorders. Dr. Rostain chairs the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at Cooper University Healthcare, is a professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at Cooper Medical School of Rowan University, and is Professor Emeritus at University of Pennsylvania, where he co-chaired the Task Force on Students' Psychological Health and Welfare from 2014 to 2016. Since the publication of their unique collaboration, The Stressed Years of Their Lives, Helping Your Kids Survive and Thrive During Their College Years in Spring 2019, Dr. Hibbs and Dr. Rostain have appeared on many radio shows, including Fresh Air with Terry Gross, and in print publications, including The Wall Street Journal and the 2020 College Edition of U.S. News and World Report. They have presented to national audiences, including K-12 educators, college faculty and counselors, parents, and groups supporting families of youth recovering from emotional disorders. Tonight, we're pleased to host them in their own hometown as part of the Free Library of Philadelphia Author Series. Welcome, Dr. Hibbs and Dr. Rostain. We'll begin with a bit of background for those you, who... Lady. Oh, yes. We'll begin with a bit of background for those who haven't yet read the stressed years of their lives. Dr. Hibbs was caught off guard when her son came home from college in a depressive spiral. Despite her background as a family psychologist, she was unprepared to deal with the depths of her son's crisis and turned to Dr. Rostain, an expert in child and adolescent psychiatry, for help. Following her son's recovery and with his generous permission, Dr. Hibbs and Dr. Rostain decided to share their experience and their expert advice with parents, guidance counselors, mental health personnel, and others who raise, counsel, and educate adolescents. Their practical and compassionate book equips readers to assess a, re a student's readiness for life on campus, to distinguish typical adolescent behavior from serious warning signs of clinical disorders, and to navigate privacy laws governing medical and educational records so they can advocate for their child before or after problems arise. As the co-authors describe, the transition from high school to college includes potential roadblocks and pitfalls for parents and students alike. 
with mental health problems among college age students rising at an alarming rate and campus hazards like binge drinking and sexual assault making headlines. Parents are right to be concerned about shipping their children off to live independently. And the COVID-19 pandemic, disrupting education and creating uncertainty about the future, has only made this transition to college more fraught. But Dr. Hibbs and Dr. Rostain believe that the disruptions caused by COVID-19, which prompt introspection and attention to mental health, also present opportunities for colleges to better understand and address inequities among their students, and for parents to help their children develop an autonomous self. Tonight, B and Tony, as they refer to each other, will discuss how this crisis is an occasion for children to develop the social emotional maturity they need to manage freedom and responsibility in college. Following this moderated discussion, the authors will answer questions from the audience, which you can submit through the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. So I thought I'd begin by asking B. Um, many parents are having a hard time assuring their kids that everything will be okay when they're just not sure themselves. So should parents keep their own anxiety, sadness, and grief from their kids? Well, parenting is always a balancing act between managing our own realities and our own anxieties and grief, and, um, and yet striking a balance by managing our own anxieties, striking a balance about how to be helpful to support their kids as they learn to cope, because you don't have all the coping skills that, you know, as a teenager or a 20-year-old, as you hopefully have as a parent. But I think the thing that I would encourage parents to do is not to bright side this. I mean, this has, you know, landed in a just a trifecta of the pandemic, health crises left and right, and and really the great reckoning of racism in our country, as well as the income inequities and job losses. So this is, I, I think kids would experience it as bright siding if parents said, oh, don't worry, this will be okay because it's not okay. And we also really don't, the, the future is more uncertain than it used to be. But I think what parents can do is they can validate the reality of the changes and losses that children and teenagers and young adults have experienced I think my favorite vignette on this is a young woman who came back from her overseas studies and she, her first day home in quarantine, she wrote down all the 50 things she had lost this year in, in the epidemic. And then she was able to be resilient and say, okay, what do I do now? But she had to grieve first and she had to name her losses. I think it's also important that parents could reassure, offer reassurances and build resilience in their young adults and their teenagers by sharing stories of challenging times historically, maybe historic moments that probably each generation has experienced and how they got through it. So I think that can be helpful and hopeful to teenagers and, and young adults. Helpful and hopeful is, is the way I would sum up your book. So thank you for that answer. Um, Tony, how does a parent know if their child is really struggling beyond normal adolescent behavior? Well, just to situate it in this historical moment as B has done, uh, everybody's been affected by COVID. So I wanna emphasize that everybody's trying to find this balance and some kids are having an easier time than others, just like adults. Um, and everyone I think is going through what in the DSM we might call an adjustment disorder. An adjustment disorder is when you're not feeling right because you're going through something very stressful. And so, as B said, the grieving, the sense of loss is important. Um, and I think the, uh, along with the sadness come things like moments of frustration, anger, meltdowns, irritability, uh, and then, you know, trouble maintaining usual focus, uh, attention span. And Lord knows, the things that we all love to do and could do with no, not even thinking about it, suddenly we can't do all these things. So we're, you know, we're thrown for a bit of a loss. And I guess that is to me, not a sign of 
of something that I would call warning. I think the warning signs have to do with when they, these kinds of tendencies become more extreme, when the, the kids are lethargic and bored beyond just a little bit, like when they really can't motivate, when they really can't enjoy anything, when they start to withdraw and become socially isolated and stop communicating. And when you start to see changes in their sleeping and eating patterns, again, not like people are changing their sleeping and eating patterns a little bit, but this is way off, right? Not being up at all during the day and sleeping all night and uh, sleeping, sleeping all day and staying up all night uh, and other physical symptoms of that type. And then if you really probe further, uh, when the kids start to talk about feeling worthless, feeling like life is, is really too, too burdensome, uh, and where they're really starting to express a, a sense of a loss of meaning or of hope, and their thinking is becoming more and more catastrophic, at that point, I would say, okay, you've moved beyond just an adjustment disorder, and you may be moving now into something that we might call a clinical depression or some other, um, you know, some other disorder that requires, I think, some attention. Hmm. Thank you for that helpful context. Um, B, what does research tell us about the long-term impact of crises like COVID-19 on adolescent brains and about ways to mitigate this impact? Well, it's true that experience sculpts the brain, and that is particularly true in the teenage years and also in the era of emerging adulthood, which is from years around 18 to 24. And so the, the crises that we experience in these years and actually many events that we experience in these years are just more deeply embedded in our memories. It's why we can recall, you know, it's why everyone loves golden oldies if they're my age, because we remember them so well. But that's part of how the brain is wired, in part to help us adapt to our brave new world that we're going to inherit. Um, but I think, so on the one hand, I would say many generations experience some kind of traumatic event. This one is getting three for one in terms of the um, overload of, of this pandemic and also worries about their families. Um, but part of how I think we can stress is not all bad and crises are not all bad. Part of what we're seeing is that there's a huge mobilization of youth, a huge resilience in terms of like the address to basically structural changes, more equitable changes in society, and more hopefully sociologists who really study these, uh, you know, long spans uh, in history uh, had have, have predicted that in 2020, if there were a seismic event, we would have ended the 80 year cycle in which structural change, we would have begun a new one in which structural changes in society an improvement in society overall can change quickly. The last such cycle was World War II. Huh. Wow. Um, given the peril of this condition, this current crisis, um, Tony, can you recommend a mindful approach to stress management for both parents and children? Sure, but before I do, I wanna emphasize something B just said, which is that the collective uprising that's taking place among youth um, isn't just it's partly triggered by some key events but but there was a lot of stuff bubbling before now uh, in the responses to the high school shootings and and the the age of the internet has really put a total different uh, you know layer of of, of of solidarity between kids that are separated physically and I think that's you know, when, 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 our, when our book came out a year ago, the one concern that we had was that really there wasn't a unifying kind of theme. There were different fragments. But suddenly now it seems like things are starting to come together and coalesce. And that in and of itself reminds me of when I was in college, which was really another time of great upheaval. And there was a lot of, of opportunity then for all of us as young people back then to not only question what was going on, but to really begin to say, hey, you know what, let's make a world a better place. Let's not put this off any longer. So I think a lot of us adults are taking part in that. Uh, but re relating to, though, the issue of individual stress, how do I get behind, got to get beyond this, this level of constant dis-ease with, with the uncertainty 
and the unpredictability of the current world. Um, so the first, I guess I, I like to refer to um, the, the work of, of Russell Harris, who's a, one of the originators of acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, and we've been going around the hospital at Cooper meeting with frontline um, health providers who were facing people with tremendous illnesses and who were in the ICU, and they were themselves really stressed out. So um, we found his, uh, his acronym, FACE COVID, to be really effective, F-A-C-E-C-O-V-I-D. The F stands for focus on what's in your control. And ultimately, when life feels chaotic, the best thing you can do is to focus on what it is you have some control over. And the first thing we can do is acknowledge that we're having these feelings. We're having these thoughts. They're very unsettling. We don't like them. They make us uncomfortable. The second thing we can do is the C is come back into your body. And actually, coming back into your body, the best way to do that, the best anchor for that is to breathe, is to just slow down the way in which you take a breath in and take a breath out. And in so doing, feeling all the parts of your body and doing so, engaging yourself in what's happening in the immediate situation. Instead of thinking about the future and all of the unknowns, just what's now, what is in the moment and what am I doing? C of COVID stands for committed action. How am I gonna then take what I, my motives and my desires and formulate a plan of action that will allow me to feel less hopeless and more, and more you know, engaged in a, a change process that's meaningful to me? So O is opening up then, opening up to compassion for the fact that no matter what we do, there is no simple solution. We have to open up to that realization that, you know, things are complicated. And then we start to ask ourselves, so what are the values we have right now? What really matters most? You know, is it how many toys or games or how many things I own? Or is it that the things I do, what's most important about what I'm doing on the planet? And I'm going to come back to this later on. But the the, then the next step is to put your values into action. You need to figure out the resources you're going to need. So kids today are going online and finding one another, the, the social resources, as well as the intellectual and, 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 and the, the kind of resources they need to put, put, in fact, plans into action. So, you know, YouTube teaches us all kinds of things. It can also entertain us. But finding resources and reaching out to those resources. And finally, the D is, um, in, in Harris's terms, is to disinfect and distance. But I, I think of not just physical distance. I think of the word distance as meaning being ready to go the distance, being ready to say, this is not a sprint. I've got to get ready for you know a prolonged, longer journey ahead of me and ahead of us before we get through this crisis. Thank you. That's so helpful. Um, another question for B. Um, in the stressed years, you review common barriers to student success in college. How has this disruption of COVID-19 created an opportunity for colleges to mitigate these barriers? Colleges were already studying some of the mindset barriers that really interfere with student success or, or contribute to dropout. And one of the barriers that we talk about is the, um, the experience of not belonging. And it, that can mean different things for different student groups, but for the historically underserved and also for the, the groups in which there has been some kind of stigma or bias, which can be, the bias might be around, um, I can't make it, I'm first generation, I don't belong here, I don't look like anyone else. It can be racial, it can be socioeconomic, everyone else is going on on a foreign vacation and I'm going back home. Um, it can also be mental health issues and Tony and I of course cover that extensively. Um, it can also just feel like I didn't find my people. So there's, social, there's a social reason that kids go to college, right? Especially residential colleges. But one, some of the acceleration um, that has been uh, of the of the COVID has created, I believe, is a, a growing awareness of what helps with that sense of not belonging, what can colleges do. And so even though I think no one is really crazy about online learning, what we've actually learned 
from this is that the mentoring that really goes into having kids feel like they're connected to a faculty member, they're connected to somebody who cares about their progress and where they're going to go in their lives, um, that has become more common because now there are Zoom office hours. So when you think of it, the faculty model has been based on how many courses do you teach, which is not a mentoring experience for students. So the mentoring has been really crucial and I believe that colleges will continue Zoom office hours. Maybe they'll even credit professors for having office hours. Um, I think the other things that the this experience will do, it was it will reduce barriers to mental health problems. There's been a really skyrocketing number that's only increased with COVID in terms of anxiety and depression in this age group. And um, some of the barriers that are especially felt are among men in terms of like, I don't need help or I'm, I have to be stoic. First generation where they've never experienced, um, oh, like mental health, but there's a, somebody to talk to where it's not part of their culture, perhaps. Um, internet, international students, and also um, historical, you know, like kids who've been really, there's been overlapping prejudice, whether it's LGBT gender or whether it's racial, whether it's socioeconomic. So all these inequities have been laying bare, really, in the pandemic. And the young people feel very strongly about it. They are also the barrier to getting help in the mental health, you know, setting is that if you're in distress and you try to get in to see someone, it could be a two week wait if you're fortunate. Um, and that by then many people lose motivation to go. But if you go, oh, I'm online, I can talk to somebody today, then you've reduced a barrier. And so one of the common things that we find that's really very sad in our profession is how poorly people do when they don't seek help when needed. And so there are barriers that are dropping because of the online experience. And I'm very hopeful that this will continue for, for colleges. Thank you. Um, of, of the many concrete um, pieces of wisdom in your book, one thing that um, seems particularly helpful as in this particular moment um, is how you address the key, eight key components of social emotional maturity which I'll just list quickly, um, conscientiousness, self-management, interpersonal skills, empathy, self-control and willpower, grit, risk management, and self-acceptance. Um, so let's start with the first component, conscientiousness. Tony, how might navigating all these COVID-related guidelines and restrictions help our kids develop conscientiousness? Well, I've seen tremendous awareness now among young people. In fact, our, my own kids, and I've heard of this, uh, kids that I've been treating who are really telling their parents, listen, guys, don't go out. <laughs> don't take risks. Okay. I mean, conscientiousness is taking responsibility for the consequences of your actions and paying attention to like the ways in which any little thing might affect either your, your goals and plans or those around you. And I think this uh, current, the current crisis, because everybody's now forced to, you know, shelter in place and are starting to really spend more time together, uh, which is actually, for many of us, a very welcome change because everybody was before this thing. Everybody's running around in a million directions and parents and kids would just interact in a very, you know, sort of perfunctory way at times because everyone was so busy. Uh, and when they did, it was always very task oriented rather than just chilling with each other. So the better stories coming out of this uh, hanging out more together is that, first of all, conscientiousness then becomes more than just did you do your homework? All right. Or did you did you practice your violin? Right. Which would have been. But more importantly, it's like so. So what are we going to do together to make life work, work for each other and ourselves as a group? Um, you know, no matter what the tensions, we really need to learn how to work together as a team. And so I think that the term conscientiousness has taken on a new meaning now in that sense, in terms of the relationships we have to each other. What do we owe each other? How do we make good on those obligations? Um, you know, chores, you know, setting up schedules, all the things that 
make life more predictable, especially given the unpredictability. Um, and then conscientiousness also includes things like, well, if you stay up real late and make, you know, and, and don't get up the next day to participate, then how are you letting people down, right? Or if you take risks, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but if you're not really washing hands, keeping your mask on and, and distancing appropriately, then what does that mean? You know, are you are you really just giving up on a commitment, right, to be thoughtful and to, to make good on what you believe are, you know, important um, responsibilities? So it's not, it, 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 before the, the pandemic, when we were writing the book, we were thinking also about things like making sure that you don't, you know, cut too many corners and do things like cheat on tests or, you know, uh, you know, really take advantage of other people. But I, I actually think this, uh, in, in many of the, the kids that I work with, this whole experience has really broadened and deepened people's understanding of what it means to be socially responsible. Excellent. Great answer. <laughs> um, B, in terms of self-management, Mm -hmm. How can we best guide our college age children as they decide whether or not to return to college on campus or online in the fall? Well, it's, it's important for uh, parents to recognize that there is no one size fits all college uh, answer here. And I think colleges are still uh, tentative in terms of how they are going to roll this out. But part of risk management, obviously, is um, not telling your student what to do, but really asking them. It's really more like listen and learn from your own, your young adult here, what they've thought of, what are they concerned about, how if they're going to live in a family pod, which many of the colleges are, that are residential colleges are introducing family pods in dorms, where this is your pod that you live with or you go to class with. Um, how are they going to uh, be able to convince their peers if their peers need convincing about like what what's safe? And it's it's really a developmental task, you know, to piggyback on what Tony's saying um, of of young adults recognizing that we're moving, we're asking them to move from the sense of me to the community of we, mm -hmm. and part of it really is a. Um, a, a growth building risk management, because this is not all the 20, 30 year olds that are now getting new infections uh, are, I've heard them, you know, they, you know, argue about it back and forth with each other uh, about, oh, well, if I'm going to get, you know, get this, I'll just get it out of the way now in the summer, rather than like, this is life or death. Like think of the dining hall people that are serving you. Think of the maintenance people that are cleaning up. It's like, so we're asking them to have a developmental growth spurt to make this a we community. And I think that that's part of the task of parenting now is to guide their children to the next developmental stage. Great. Um, in terms of interpersonal skills um, for Tony, Peer groups are so crucial to our children as they develop them. Um, in this time, what are the benefits and limitations of social media to stay connected and maintain friendships during this pandemic? All right, well, let's face it. Social life at the moment, including what we're doing now, is almost exclusively digital, okay? Right. And that's been a mostly positive experience. I mean, without the internet and having to do this on our own without connecting, I only I can't even imagine how that would work. Uh, so uh, young people also they're they're much more expert on this than us older folks. Okay, they 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 are much more adept at getting to know you know what's going on and 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 you know participating in the interactions that are going on. Now I do think it's important for young people to show their parents. What they're up to and where they're visiting you know what sites they're in. it doesn't mean the parents should be checking up on them it's more like hey let me get a sense of what you're learning and what and, and if you want to share with me that's even better so you know checking out the places that the sites that they're visiting and especially who who are the people they're hanging out with because just like if they were going out to be with friends you'd want to know well who are you going out with tonight like, let me hear at least, oh, like, just like you want to know, like, who are your best friends in college or who are your best friends in high school? You'd want to know who they are. Well, the same thing goes for the 
the digital interactions people are having. So who you hang out with? Hey, let me say hi to him. You know, now that may be met with resistance and I wouldn't push it and say, oh, you know, kid is being difficult, but more like just simply saying, hey, you know, I'm still making sure that you're okay because that's my job. All right. As a parent. Um, and it's not like I don't trust you. It's just I'll feel more trusting of what you're doing if uh, if uh, if I get to see, you know, the sites you're visiting, because, you know, you might discover they're going to some pretty weird places and that might not be such a good idea to visit um, sites that are on in, I would call unhealthy. Uh, then finally, I guess um, thinking about how much time do you spend in the Internet and setting limits on that Our our book really does get into discussions about that, about being the master of the technology rather than having the technology master you. Mm -hmm. And that's a question I ask all of my, you know, young patients is, you know, what's your relationship to your device? How do you look at your device? How much do you spend on? And, and is your device running you or are you running it? And how do you set limits if you think it's too much? Um, I guess the main disadvantage, and I just have to say this is true for all of us, not just kids, I guess not being in the same place physically with each other, not being able to kind of sense the energy, the joy of just human contact, uh, you know, and being, you know, just casual, getting together. Hey, I go down to the cafeteria or I just go down the block. I run into people, you know, that kind of casual connecting isn't happening. Uh, and of course, the physicality of relationships mm -hmm. and what we need in that realm of holding and being held. I think that's really, really a huge uh, barrier right now. And that's one that I think colleges are scratching their heads and thinking, well, what are we going to do about that? You know, like, how are we going to stop intimacy? You can't. You can't mm -hmm. stop intimacy. Mm -hmm. So um, th those are some of the ins and outs. I do think that overall, uh, the internet has been where it's at right now, and we just have to get, you know, comfortable with making sure there are the right parameters and avoiding the the really uh, not so nice places. Let's put it that way. Thank you. And this seems sort of like a flip side to what Tony's just said. B, in terms of self control and willpower, what role should parents of adult children returning home play in terms of encouraging their child's self control and willpower with with things like indulging in food or alcohol or screen time, now that it's visible. <laughs> uh, yes, it's now that it's visible, which is, um, so there's a lot that parents don't see. <laughs> and then they're a little bit like, it's a little cringeworthy, like, ah. I, you know, I would say talk, talk early. Don't land, you know, with both feet on your kid after they've had like some like blowout evening with too much alcohol or, you know, a food orgy or something. Um, don't pick that moment because you'll just get an emotional reaction. So your goal is to be able to have a constructive conversation and to actually uh, learn whether your, your child is concerned about it. And you're not going to have that if the timing's not right and if you're not if you don't approach it in a kind of lot, like I, you know, I want to talk about this. I'm not wanting to put you on the defensive. I want to honor your autonomy. I know that, you know, most of the time you're not at home under our roof, but, you know, everybody's coping like they're coping in this really crazy weird time. And I, let's talk about how you're coping. And and are you worried about it? And are you worried about the frequency? Or do you know what runs in a family? Because like, you know, you don't have to go too many generations down to like talk about the auntie, uncle, the self, that's like, oh yeah, I struggled with this at your age, or oh yeah, you know, how do you know when you kind of, you know, to use Tony's example with the internet, how do you know when uh, like, this is like too much? Are you coping by, uh, you know, staying up all night, like what's the routine? So what you're really trying to understand also as a parent is how do, how is a child managing their life? Mm -hmm. Because the, how are they coping? How are they? So one of the invisible curricula of uh, college success really is how do you manage your life? How do you manage your time? How do you cope when you're stressed? And so that's been a challenge for most people 
but parents have probably had many more years of learning what's good and bad coping than kids have. And, and so it is important to talk, not lecture, listen, you know, and learn and, and approach it in a respectful way with your, with your college student. Yeah, I mean, I would emphasize, I would emphasize what you just said that in the book, we really think about helping kids think through what decisions are they making and how do they go about mm -hmm. making the choices that they're making, mm -hmm. what's mm -hmm. behind. And for, a lot of kids actually appreciate that because sometimes they're making choices not for the best reasons. And they've never had a, you know, to have the parents say, well, I'm not going to be there to tell you what to do. So I want to know how are you going to be thinking through uh, then it becomes more of a dialogue. That's what we emphasize. It's right. not a lecture. Right. It's not a, you know, you better watch out or, you know, uh, scaring people straight, so to speak, whatever. It, those things don't work. We know that. But saying, how do you decide, you know, make, what are the basis for your judgments? And, you know, what are the, what are the pros and cons? It's kind of like motivational interviewing. Uh, we teach parents to do that when you read the book. It's like looking at both sides and helping kids realize that it, they, they do have to make choices. That's such a great term, invisible curricula. <laughs> I think yeah. we should all keep that in mind. Um, and Tony, in terms of grit, how can parents help their child cope with disappointment and losses, things like summer jobs, you know, I was, they were supposed to go out to, on a semester abroad, um, even just getting to attend college on campus that are the result of this COVID-19 pandemic. Ooh, yeah. And again, I mean, and it would be the same, by the way, before COVID, we'd heard questions, we presented at, at Penn and we heard questions from parents like, what do I do when my kid isn't chosen to get into the fraternity or sorority they want? You know, disappointment and losses happen all the time in college and, and in high school, right? So mm -hmm. just to echo what, what B said, before, you know, we're not, you don't bright side it. You don't try to make it better. You listen and you listen some more and you just hold it and you let the, the young person understand that you feel for them, but you know, you're not trying to uh, fix it for them because that's not going to work. And then to appreciate that uh, dealing with loss is probably one of the most important lessons people can learn. Uh, in a way, the, the myth of our, of our society has always been anyone can make it if they work hard enough and you should always be a winner. Well, no, that's impossible. First of all, it's more than our own effort that gets us places, things like luck and where we were born, the good fortune, you know, who, who, who our parents knew or, you know, that we happen to have some skills that we were, you know, cultivated early on. But the other thing is that there's a lot of hard stuff that goes on. And, and I think this latest, um, you know, kind of growing understanding of the problems of, of, of people of color in this country and of the experiences they've had, you know, it's like an eye opener for a lot of people, although it shouldn't have been, but it is, is that mm -hmm. it's difficult. Life is difficult. And if you make your kid think like life is just going to be fun, you're really setting them up for terrible failure. Uh, but even though it's difficult, it's rewarding. And so I think that the pleasure one reaches at the end of working through the loss, and I love, I love B's example, you know, listing all the things you lost and, you know, you didn't get to graduate the way you wanted to, you didn't get to, you know, say goodbye to your friends or whatever. Ultimately, what do I do now is the question. And I would go back to the earlier thing I said before about mindfulness. It's like, okay, I'm feeling sad right now. Like some kids, when they're feeling sad, they like to listen to sad music. Others want to listen to angry or, you know, energized. What is, what is going to help you would be the question I'd ask as a parent. What do you think would help you to get through this? Mm -hmm. And if they just say, I don't know, I just need to, like, leave me alone. I've got to work through it. Then you can say, okay, but if you need to talk, I'm here. You know, you don't insist on the talk. You just say, hey, I get it. I get it, you know. And you might, if they want to know your heartbreak story, it's time to talk about your heartbreak story. I, I mean, every one of us has had heartbreak, um, mm -hmm. and that's just part of living. Very true. Um, and before we get to the audience questions, I'm going to ask B one more question. How can parents encourage their children to develop an open mindset and seek help when needed, which is Tony was sort of leading into? It it really, parents are so crucial. And one of the things that Tony and I really wanted to underscore in this book 
is how important the support of families is. And it's an overwhelming um, variable in terms of how free kids feel to say, I'm not doing well. They feel safe enough to disclose that. Most, most teens and young adults, they're going to tell a friend first. Um, and that's, that's just normal. But I would encourage parents to start in whatever available moment there is, again, not lecture style, but just like what runs in the family. Own up to your own stuff. Own up to like, you know, did you ever get help for what? Um, was it useful? How, you know, kind of what did you learn? And, and also share, uh, again, in just kind of conversation. It's, it's really a conversational topic in a sense because there's so many issues, anxiety, depression, that are quite common. They're as common as the common cold. And instead of us pretending like, oh, my God, that's scary, it's like well, the scary thing is not getting treatment. Because, uh, you know, that's the scary thing. Because these are treatable. You can, you can get to a different spot. You don't have to suffer in this way. And so part of it is if parents can, just talk about it in a matter-of-fact way, not a scary way. Be, and also, so that's, a, you know, some parents have a negative bias, like, oh, that's awful, that's weak. That it's not. Like, being, it, it's just human. I think the other thing that I would say is that some parents is trickier. Some parents have a positive bias. No, 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 you're not depressed. Oh, this will pass. You, this, you can't. No, 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 you're a happy kid. Go out again and come back with a smile. Seriously, some parents tell kids this. <laughs> so it's like you don't want a positive bias if your kid is actually telling you something because they're not going to tell you again if you bright-sided it the first time. Um, and so being, having an open mindset, helping, you know, encouraging kids, if they tell you I'm struggling with this and that, okay, let's talk about your options. And also on, on, on college websites, college really is a fabulous resource in terms of the counseling that's available for this age group, because otherwise it's pretty hard to find. Um, and whether it's at a community college or a four-year college level, they're going to have websites. They're going to have apps that. So if you if you don't do a face to face appointment in kind of the traditional you know therapy client mode, um, you can do telemedicine. There's there's a wonderful groups like the NAMI the on campus. There's Jed. There's Active Mind. So Tony and I developed a really large appendix in the back, partly so parents would know oh, who do you turn to. So helping your kid know there's help out there. That's Can I just, I want to add one thing to what Bian was saying, because the other little piece of this has to do with what we call self-stigma or shame. Yes, About right. needing help. And when we did our, our when, you know, we, when we had the task force at Penn, was really triggered by a lot of concern around some very prominent student, student suicides and a lot of stress on the campus. And the more we talked to students, the more we realized, like, they were kind of trying to wear this pen face, you know, always, I'm mm -hmm. fine. This idea that it, you don't want to ever let anyone know that you weren't fine. And so we, we B and I have been talking a lot of pe people, we've talked a lot about this topic, getting over the stigma of having something that needs treatment so that you don't wait too long. Because there are studies that show, for example, that, you know, out of a group of students, college students who endorsed suicidal ideation or even thoughts about actually beyond thinking, even planning, you know, only about a quarter of them went for help. And the other three quarters were saying, I don't really need it, or there was something wrong about it. And that's or I'm really too busy. So <laughs> I think what families need to do is, yeah, as B said, these are family issues too. Get over the shame of whatever it was that has has made life hard, and not be afraid to face it. That's really a life saving approach. We think. Thank you so much for that. Um, from the audience, some of the questions are. Um, maybe slightly beyond what you address in your book, but I know you'll have interesting thoughts about them. Um, 
The first is, what advice would you give to an African-American student going to college in light of this new awakening to institutional racism? And B or Tony, yeah. whoever would like to take Thank it. you for, now that's a question that's been on our minds. We've, we, we, so the first and most important thing is go to a school that is affirming of your identity, where there's a critical mass of support people who know what you've been through because they are like you and fundamentally understand that it's going to be, you know, difficult in some ways uh, to feel fully comfortable and also to be able to go to a school that encourages diversity to have people who really are building a, a tapestry, if you will, or, you know, a multi, a multicolored quilt of, of not only students, but of faculty. Okay because you need a critical mass of faculty and staff. Um, so, um, and of course, most colleges nowadays have made very strong statements in the last few months about the, these events and about the need to really teach about these issues, about racism. So is the college also getting white people to talk about this, not just to have African-American students instructing the Caucasian or white students to do this. And down the road, of course, all other diverse groups. I mean, there are so many different, um, you know, permutations of this question of diversity. Uh, like I talk a lot about neurodiversity as well, but for the African-American student to be sure they feel at home and that they've talked to other students on campus who let them know what the climate is like. And I would add to that, that one of the things that colleges have learned in terms of these barriers to student success is that beyond the academic learning, the mentoring of older students to the younger, uh, you know, to the freshman classes um, in a very small group way where there's a, um, a, a kind of sense of like, I made it, here's what to expect, Here's what kind of here's what you can do to cope. Um, you know, you'll make it too. That kind of student to student mentoring, older student, younger student, colleges are building that more into their their programs today. Some of them are online, some of them are on in person. But I would look for colleges. I would like hope that you'd be in a college where you would have, and this would I think be true to many of the historically underserved groups, but because there's often overlapping prejudice, but you'd want to feel like there are students that you have an affinity group with that can support you if you're having a, a rough time. Uh, because we often find in colleges anyway, what, what kids go for is the social capital. It's not just the academic learning. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's very thoughtful. Um, this is a more uh, specific question, but can you address the potential eating disorders that could be developing during this time when so much else is out of their control? You, Tony, I, oh, you know, I don't say, know okay. that there's a perfect so, answer. So if what we're but, asking, the question may be asking, is being around food all the time going to make people eat in a more dysregulated oh, I see. way? Yeah. Uh, and the answer is yes, possibly. Um, uh, eating disorders are very common in, the, in, in, in young people. And um, again, they evolve for a number of reasons, biological predisposition, messaging in the society about thinness, uh, and, you know, with the internet, access to ways to do it that, you know, can be hidden from others, uh, uh, you know. The, and I'd say that um, being, so it gets back to mindfulness and awareness of one's own habits. Uh, being less um, in control of one's eating means that people will then uh, be more likely to uh, overeat or purge, etc. Uh, we have a number of patients that I've been discussing this with lately, um, especially those that were um, already had eating disorders that have noted that the stress of the COVID and the feeling of wanting control you know, the psychological dynamics of, of certain types of eating disorders have to do with this desire for control. So, yeah, I think there is there's growing rates of everything right now. They're just not as quick, as easy to report at times. But we, as, we expect right now that 
um, you know, our, I, I, we, we're talking openly in psychology and psychiatry that the, the next pandemic is the mental health pandemic that mm. the COVID and its consequences have un, is going to unleash. So yes, being able to to kind of make healthy eating a priority and talk. But about uh, you know, I, I would jump in just a bit just to say. Uh, rather than pathologize ourselves, many people are having disordered eating. <laughs> right. They're eating stuff they wouldn't have ordinarily eaten. We're or eating more better. Of it I, or, we're eating better. And they just feel like, whatever, I'm in my sweatpants anyway. Like, I'm not showing up yeah. for anybody. Um, so I don't want people to overly pathologize themselves or worry too much. If it, you know, if it's situational, it may pass. If you're aware of it and you can talk about it, like, oh my God, like I'm really just eating crap now. Um, those are things that like, uh, you know, the ability to talk about how we're coping um, plays a part and like having, you know, things that may be disordered eating not become eating disorders. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, th this is a, a practical question, but I think you'll also probably address the context and, and perhaps um, the psychological context for this. Uh, what suggestions do you have for secondary, middle school, and elementary students who do not have access to computers and devices in their homes, especially with libraries closed? Aren't these students going to be at a disadvantage when they prepare to go to college? I imagine um, part of the question is about the parents' fear. This well, is huge. I, yeah, I'm, go ahead, B. Go ahead. I, you know, I, I, certainly that's one of the, I mean, at, at all educational levels, the pandemic has really lain bare so many um, socioeconomic inequities. And uh, colleges, certainly, there are programs that are bridge programs to help children have a bridge to the next level of, um, you know, uh, of their schooling. But yes, I mean, this is really, and sadly, part of what's happened, which I truly hope will be addressed if there is, you know, structural economic change, um, is, is the, uh, and some schools are already doing this, but the state's budgets have just slashed and slashed and slashed public education. And so some of the cities are taking on, I mean, it's going to be tough because of like the revenues. We're going to have to figure out what gets funded. But it is a societal problem because we do look to our youth to be the educated workforce. And many of them are disadvantaged right now without access to the Internet or sufficient broadband. And the public places where you used to be able to be just go sit, that assumes you have a laptop or something you can go sit with. But they're, they've been closed also. So it's a, I, I, it's, a, it's a significant problem. And I think it is also being addressed politically because it has to be. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. This calls for advocacy. I mean, to the individual who asked that question, if you're struggling with this, I think it's directly appealing to the school district and saying, what can you do to make, help my kid get access to, to, to a computer that they can use so that they can study? I do hope that the libraries will start to open up soon to let kids back in so they can. Because, you know, when you go to the Free Library of, of, of Philadelphia, you'll see lots of kids there after school who mm -hmm. don't have computers at home and are using those computers. So to the extent that maybe this is a call to say, hey, folks, if you got old laptops around, why don't we, you know, recycle them? I know that, you know, Bill Gates and others have really tried to take on the digital divide. divide. I think that, uh, you know, the it, it, it just it behooves us all to say that just like every child needs school, in order to be ready for school, it used to be you have to have a pencil and a book <laughs> and a ruler, you need a laptop, you know? And that's part of what kids need to succeed in school. And I agree with B, part of what I believe will be the real motive for the next next coming together will be how to rebuild society, rebuild our country along lines of equity. And then the key to the future for young people is to have, you know, to not be left behind in terms of the digital, the access to the, to the to, to digital to the digital highway that everyone is traveling on, and the other question would be why can't schools that are more affluent make available some of their curriculum, some of their good teaching, 
for teachers in, in, in less affluent schools to have access to. You know, it's like you need to start to share. Um, maybe people then would be able to uh, benefit from what the what others are doing. And I do think right now, teachers everywhere are being more and more creative with trying to reach yeah. their students. I do feel really very are. inspired by what I see teachers trying to do. All of us. I mean, I'm doing this at my level and, you know, university teaching, medical school teaching, but I see it at every level. It does not achieve the same kinds of learning as in the classroom, but it does achieve quite a bit. And uh, let's let's try to make it more accessible. Thank you. Um, how can parents support students that may not be able to return to campus with their peers mm -hmm. due to chronic illness or immunodeficiency? How can they combat the sense of othering from their group? Wow. That's that, you know, it's such a dilemma for young people who's um, uh, in that that sense of it's a we community. And they I do know kids who do whose parents and they talk about who are your friends? Are they are you social distancing? Do they wear masks? Do they respect the fact that we're at risk? And um, and the family has discussions about who's in our family pod. So it's a little bit like kids taking on um, the responsibility of saying, I, I know one just recently who passed up a party that he really wanted to go to because he realized no one would be wearing a mask. And, um, and if their family and his family like follows the science, they're like, well, then how are you gonna go? And so it was a thoughtful discussion but it was one in which the child didn't feel like you can't do this, but that the child agreed, like, I don't want to do this. Like, who wants to put their parent or grandparent at risk? And so there is a sense of otherness, but there's also, or can be, certainly, but it's also um, a dialogue that, that teens will have with their friends about what friends need to do to help each other. So it may be it may be that one student will go to it go to co go to back to the residential college, but need like support from everyone around them to maintain the distance because they are, you know, more at risk. But they also may decide to to stick around and go to a, a local school until the pandemic is over. They may because at least there's more, uh, you know, control. You're you're living at home. Right. rather than living in a dorm. I don't know how dorms are going to maintain. Um, I, I don't think even most universities know this. How are they going to maintain the so the physical distancing and, you know, and, and, and so if you are, your health is at risk for being in, in those situations, um, I, it behooves, I think, everyone who is in that, who's, who's, who's immunocompromised to really call the university and say, Hey, look, you know, I'm thinking of coming back to school, but what do you recommend? I would call the head of the student health uh, and talk to the head of student health and say, what do you think? You know, what am I, what, what safeguards are going to be there for me? And, and then once they get there, overcoming what B said about the social, maybe ostracism for not being willing to forego those rules. Um, and maybe finding other people who are in a similar boat who support each other for being careful. Like, hey, well, that's radical. I'm going to be mindful and careful of my own body. I mean, they, they do have, you know, now uh, in certain colleges anyway, like dorms for people who are sober, you know, who yeah. like, no, I'm not using substances because they elect to be there. Uh, you know, what I've read is that there, some of the colleges, residential colleges are having what they call like pods, pods of people who agree these are the rules we're following or this is what we're going to do like and i'm electing to join this pod um and others are they're not going to have roommates um so colleges will make accommodations that they can but certainly it's i think up to parents to help kids make guided choices and one of the colleges there's several actually now are creating more online global citizen gap years for kids who like, hey, you don't want to come back this year for reasons that are totally understandable. You know, for like a, a fourth of the cost of what we might have charged, here's a 15 week program that's our structured gap year 
in which you can become basically, you know, kind of work on behalf of your community, the global good. The, so there's programs that colleges are now developing to try to help kids have more choices than just come back to the residential college. Excellent advice. I um, mean, this seems related, um, and I'll ask Tony, but B, I'm sure you have thoughts about this too. For some high school and college students on the autism spectrum, this time at home has decreased their anxiety and improved their interpersonal skills. Does this improvement indicate that homeschooling might be a better option? How might these strengthened skills help a child transition back to school? So there are a lot of questions in that question. Uh, I have heard a number of my patients on the spectrum say things like, well, now everyone knows what it's like to be, you know, <laughs> somewhat limited in being able to process social information. I mean, they've actually felt more relaxed interacting through Zoom than they would if they were in school, either high school or college, that there is a, because the information, social information is coming in a more limited bandwidth, they can process more of it and they can see that everyone's kind of in the same boat. Um, so I have about half of my kids are really feeling good about not having to go to school, not because they don't like school, but because the social scene at school is difficult for them. And this is kind of a break from that. And they can then do what they want to do, right? They don't have to. Also, there are platforms at times that allow the kids to move in and out with more, not as much sit in this front of the screen for eight hours a day. So, you know, separate work. And, you know, they will though say, hey, uh, those small Zoom groups, you know, those do get a little bit more on my nerves, you know, blah, blah, blah. So that's the group that are really happier overall. Then there's another group, though, that I think are a little more, um, they really have a harder time because they're not getting the reinforcement of, of, of the interactions, okay? And by that, I mean, they're, they're usually the ones who would want other people to bring them out and talk to them. So they're the ones who need someone to say, hey, how are you doing today? And that doesn't happen as spontaneously because of the format of the, of the learning. Now, with respect to is homeschooling a better option? Well, you know, homeschooling has been around for, for a while, for decades. And one of the concerns we all have, especially those of us that work with kids with learning differences, is it's fine to do homeschooling from the purposes of learning academics, perhaps. But again, most homeschooling programs actually require some social activity, whether it's a gym class or, or, or music or, or even just going and, and hanging out on and project learning in groups. And again, I would just say, yeah, more and more homeschooling uh, organizations provide that now and they actually provide it through the internet. So things have evolved. Uh, the other key thing about homeschooling, though, is someone's got to be at home watching over to make sure, at least with the with the younger kids, you know, you were using younger kids in this question, to make sure that that a that the kids being able to get is, is, is able to handle the amount of information is, is help, getting help with organizing, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it is exhausting work for parents, especially those that are trying to work at home. <laughs> while their kids in school at home. Right. This has been an amazingly complicated spring. Uh, sure. But overall, I think the, you know, it's the, the, the pluses, I think the pluses outweigh the money. But I have heard this from a number of parents though, when the school district did not program special education, I mean, they're like Marion School District, Lower Marion School District did not for a while have special ed classes for their special ed kids. It took them a long time. Once the, uh, I mean, I don't mean to rag on them per se. They're not unique. Many school districts around were, they were barely able to get the, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the learning together for the neurotypical kids. Uh, when it came to the kids with learning disabilities, and especially those that need an in-class aid or somebody to help them stay organized and, and, and engaged, oh my God. So that has, that's, that's an unfolding story. Stay tuned. There are a lot of, of unhappy families right now with the kind of discrimination that's been experienced um, through this this transition. And it's not that it's, 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 it's been settled by any means. And I would 
I would, again, it's another area for advocacy. Excellent. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then give you both a chance to make a final statement, just because okay. we want to stay on time. Um, this is maybe a straightforward uh, answer, and you can either of you can answer. Um, do you have recommendations on getting a complete evaluation um, for your child or the student? It's um... There are certain psychological evaluations now, just like telemedicine, just like therapy, that are being done online. Yeah. Um, it's a bit more complicated, but um, in terms of the the person who has to conduct it, but almost everything is able. You you, you can do it online now, so that's um, it, it's just different than it had been, but. Um, you know, so much of medicine as well as psychiatry and psychology, this play therapy, it's moved online. It's quite remarkable. But you want to go, you want to go someplace where they listen to you, where they understand what you're asking about your child, whether, whether they do a biopsychosocial evaluation, mm -hmm. you know, and pay attention to all the dimensions, where they do a good developmental history. And if the child needs testing to be sure that it's indicated, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the kids who are not doing well in school by law are entitled to get an evaluation. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that people should pursue that. Great. Thank you. Um, and before we close, what would you, each of you like to say as a final thought to comfort, <laughs> um, inspire? Give hope to these well, people. all right. Let me go first. B. I will to say two things. First of all, this has been great. I, it's a dream come true to have this opportunity to be a speaker at the Free Library of Philadelphia. I've lived in Philly for forty years. <laughs> it is my home. I love the institution. Thank you for hosting us, and thank you, B, for getting me on this journey uh, with you. Uh, what I will speak to as my closing thought is really to quote from Viktor Frankl, who, who's, you know, whose book Man's Search for Meaning for me was a very powerful book I read in college. And Dr. Frankl is a psychoanalyst who survived concentration camp and had to figure out during that experience, you know, how, what gave his life meaning and how did he get through it? And that's why the book is called Man's Search for Meaning. But the quote that I'll leave you with is, when we're no longer able to change our situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. Mm -hmm. And to me, that gives me inspiration to say to all of you listening that there is still the opportunity. And if there is a silver lining to this entire unfolding crises after crises, it's that these circumstances are well beyond our control. So we have to figure out how to change ourselves to meet them, to meet one another, and to do what we can to uh, to get through this. Um, and I think that the, the sense of purpose then that a time like this gets us to reevaluate our fundamental existential values is, I think, you know, uh, an important moment for all of us. So I wish everyone listening, you know, the courage and the fortitude to figure that out and to keep asking. Thank you. And how about you, B? I, I also want to echo Tony's thanks to the Free Library for hosting us this evening. It's a, my favorite uh, place to be is the author's events, and it's a thrill to be on it. Um, I also want to thank Tony, my co-author, for joining me in this like incredible uh, you know, adventure, really, uh, that has had so many twists and turns. And what Libby, who is always too modest about her accomplishments, didn't tell anyone, is that Libby taught me memoir writing when I first approached her many years ago to say, ah, like, I'm trying to make sense out of, you know, what's happened, you know, to my oldest son. And Libby was just an incredible both teacher, she'd also taught memoir writing at Bryn Mawr College, and, um, and also was really the first person who had read my work um, and said, oh, there's so many lessons here. And I said, what? <laughs> um, because at that moment in time, I was just trying to make sense out of what I had come to understand. 
Um, and my oldest son, who gave us permission to write this, had a, a quite a funny response when I asked him, could we share his story? And he said, mom, why would anyone want to read that? It's so depressing. <laughs> and I said, but you, you, got, you got to a better spot. And so part of what Tony and I, Libby, all want to say, I think to you as parents and audience and kids and students out there is you can get to a better spot and together we will get to a better spot. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, this uh, broadcast will be recorded or has been recorded. So you'll be able to revisit it if there were things that you wanted to take notes about. Um, thank you so much, B and Tony, for your wisdom, thank you. your heart, and your encouragement. Thank you, and your <laughs> thank you Libby. You're a, great, you're a great moderator. Great. I, yes. I so enjoyed myself. Um, thank you for asking me. Um, and thank you to the Philadelphia Free Library and to all of you for coming. Good luck. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Thank you.